Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In recent episodes, I have been going back through a newsletter that I publish, where in recent issues of that newsletter, I have been describing figures and kind of where my mind goes to when I see a figure and as I think about how I would go about recreating that figure. The newsletter is all text. There's very little code. The only code that's there is maybe a little snippet of code to simulate some data to allow you to work with the code to go ahead and generate your own version of the figure. If you want to get subscribed to this newsletter, and you should, down below in the description to this video, you will find a link that will allow you to go ahead and subscribe. Well, back uh, at the beginning of September, I want to say, um, Georg Anderson heard my call for people to send me figures that they thought were pretty cool. Georg, I believe, is in Sweden, and he sent me this figure that is maybe a little bit washed out because the background is green, and so a lot of kind of the symbols and text kind of blends in or washes into the background. This is a figure comparing the values that farmers and non-farmers have for the rule of landscape in which farming is done, as I understand it. Uh, the labels here are all in Swedish. And so as you can see from the title, um, values of farmers differ little from non-farmers, right? And so if they're the same, uh, the value is the same by both populations, you'd expect them to fall straight on the line. Um, some others, which I think this is landscape, uh, fall further off the line, right? So um, the fact that they'd made this kind of scatter plot with a diagonal line, I thought was really interesting. Something else they've done is obviously to label the some of the points. Not all of the points are labeled. I think there's about 20 points here, and there's maybe about uh, 10 or so different labels. And so they're, I think, applying some filtering to the data to indicate which ones they label. The labels, I think, are colored according to the difference in perception of farmers and non-farmers, okay? So that's cool. I like that. Uh, one of the challenges with that, as we can kind of see here, especially with these long Swedish names, is that sometimes it's hard to know what goes with what, what label goes with what point. So I think this culture, uh, Historica Varden, uh, goes with that point. Um, but kind of when we get down in here, this, uh, uh, you're going to make me pronounce this, right? Livskvalet. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure if it goes with that point or with that point. It's kind of hard to say, right? And so that's kind of a problem when you're plotting text on a scatter plot. Okay. We can also have a problem like this here, where this um, RE and recreation falls on top of a point that I think is like dead on uh, that diagonal line. So anyway, that's an interesting thing, the, the text and the coloring of the text being related to the difference in perception between farmers and non-farmers. That's cool. Um, also, I noticed that the y-axis text is at a 45 degree angle. Not necessarily my preferred way to do it, but it's a way to do it. Uh, they have a colored background, which is kind of cool. Uh, we normally only ever see gray or white, <laughs> so um, a green background. Um, also, they have their title going across the top of the, the plot, and also their labels there are also at an angle. So there's a few things here that we can experiment with in our own R programming journey using ggplot2. I'm going to head over here to our studio. I don't have the exact data that Georg had or whoever generated that figure had. And so I've simulated some of the data um, using some, <laughs> uh, some values that I thought were interesting or just things that I think about when I think about rural area. And that then creates a data frame that we'll call survey, which again is something that I can imagine whoever generated that figure that Georg sent me, something that they may have had, right? And so we have a column for like the value that the person holds the farmer, the non-farmer, and then kind of the percent of farmers or non-farmers that saw that as an important value about living in a rural area, okay? Again, this can be generalized to many different things. In fact, we made a plot a lot like this a couple of years ago when the COVID-19 vaccine was kind of about to be rolled out. I showed that we could make a plot with one axis being kind of people's perceptions in different countries in say like 2020, and then the other was maybe 2021, right? And so we could see how people's perceptions had changed over time. And so if they had the same perception, they'd be right on that diagonal. I'll put a link to that video up here across the top. And so again, if we have survey pipe to ggplot AES, um, on the x-axis, I'll put non-farmer. On the y, I'll put farmer. And then we'll do geom point. And so there then is our scatter plot, right? Again, 
is all simulated. Um, I do have a random number generator seed here. So if you run the same code that I have, you should get the same plot that I have. Also, if you want this code down below in the description is a link to a blog post where you can go and get this code as well. All right, so that's our scatter plot. I think the next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and put on my diagonal line. And so to do that, we're gonna do geom AB line. So I need to add that and we'll do geom AB line. And so AB line will take a couple of values. Um, and so there is a slope, which I'll say one and an intercept, which I'll say is zero. So that gets us a 45 degree line, right? Very cool. And so I can see that already my plot is a little bit squished. Um, we don't have the same limits on the y-axis as we do on the x-axis. And so maybe here I'll go ahead and do chord Cartesian and I'll do x lim. Uh, let's go from zero to 50 and y lim from zero to 50. And so now we have all the data represented and it's a nice square area. Instead of chord Cartesian, maybe what we could do instead uh, would be chord equal. And so chord equal makes it so that the uh, distance in increment or the increment size on the x-axis is the same as that on the y-axis, right? So what we had before was that it basically fills up the, the vertical space, right? Whereas this, it's keeping the vertical space tight, compact, uh, so that basically the, the distance between zero and 50 is the same uh, on the y-axis as it is also on the x-axis. So I like that look of having chord equal. While I'm at it, I think I'll go ahead and save this. So I'll do gg save, and I'll call this diagonal uh, scatter.png, and I'll do width equals five, height equals five. So as you've probably heard me say on other episodes, I like to print things out to a file because um, this is what the finished production is gonna look like. And before I worry about kind of the placement of the different titles or the size of different things, I wanna know what the actual size or the dimensions are gonna look like because if I do it in our studio and move things around, then things get kind of jostled a bit and it, it never ends well. So I'm gonna go ahead and add on the text label. That's the only geome we haven't added. So we'll go ahead and do geome text. And the label um, is going to be uh, the value. And so here in AES, we could do label equals value. And there we go. We see that like bicycling, I just made these up, <laughs> uh, and farm stands are falling right on the point, right? And so, um, and again, down in here, things get pretty jumbled pretty quickly. And so something we'll want to think about is how do we dodge the text so it's not right on the point. But at this point, we have all the geomes represented and that looks pretty good. Um, one thing that we don't have mapped to the data is the difference in perception of non-farmers and farmers. Let's come back up to our survey and I'm gonna do a mutate to create a diff column. And that's gonna be the difference between the farmer uh, and non-farmer and this is gonna give me negative values, right? Because sometimes farmer might be higher than non-farmer and vice versa. And I'm not really gonna say one is right or wrong or the reference point. And so instead what I'll do is like abs for absolute value. And so now again, if we look at survey, we see that this diff column has all positive values. All right, good. And so now what we can do, um, make sure I run my seed to get all that right, um, is that now in here I can do color equals diff. So now what we see is that things that fall further away from that diagonal line are a lighter blue, um, and things that fall right on the line are kind of this really dark blue, or maybe even it's black. Now we wanna go about making this look nice, right? So I always like to start with the easy stuff first. So let's start with our labels. And so I will do that with the labs function. And so for labs, we can have X and Y. We can also have a title, and then we also have our color um, as an aesthetic that we have a title for. Right now, the color is diff, right? So again, on our X and Y, they had not farmer and farmer, we'll put not farmer. And then for Y, farmer. For title, we'll put values of farmers differ little from non-farmers. 
Okay, and I'll maybe put the title on a separate line. And then for color, it's frequency difference. I'm gonna go ahead and put in the backslash n to put on a separate line. We'll do frequency difference. And I think that's the last line of what I've got so far. So that's great. Um, I think the next thing maybe I wanna do is go ahead and put percents on all the numbers. In the original, they went by tens and they had percents on those. So to get the percents, I think what we could do is scale x continuous and then for label labels we can do scales colon colon percent I'm not sure if it has the parentheses or not i've been learning uh, the scales package so we'll see if this works and i forgot to add my labs so we'll try that again ah so i've seen this problem before so it's giving me like 5000 4000 30000 instead of 30 40 50 and that's because it's assuming that it's a decimal number and it's multiplying by 100 and so for percent I need to give that uh, scale equals one. And it's complaining that argument X is missing. And so I think instead of percent, what I want is percent underscore format, and that will work well with the scale. Now we get that zero through 50% instead of 5,000%. Let's do the same thing for the Y axis. So we'll do scale Y continuous with the same syntax. We now have percent on both the Y axis and the X axis. So looking back at this figure, um, I'm noticing that it doesn't have any minor grid lines. It does have the major grid lines. So let's go ahead into theme and we'll do panel.grid.minor equals element blank. And so that got rid of those minor grid lines. That's good. If we turn back here, we see that their grid lines are actually gray with that light green background. So I'm gonna try the trick that I used in a previous episode to get the color right. Um, using my digital color meter on a Mac. That's an applications utilities and digi digital color meter. I'm pretty sure Windows has something like that, but you'll have to kind of search around. Otherwise, there's a lot of online tools and there's also like a, a Chrome built-in um, tool that will allow you to do the same thing. So I'll go ahead and copy this and then come back to our studio and I'll do panel.background element uh, rect. I'll do fill equals that so that's that light green color and then maybe here for panel dot grid dot major i'll do element line and we'll do color equals gray so of course that's that green background looking good i think our lines are perhaps a little bit too thick so maybe here for my panel grid major element line i'll do line width equals 0 0.25 so i think mine might still be a little too thick maybe we'll lighten it a little bit but I think also I have tick marks, whereas theirs doesn't have tick marks. So let's go ahead and maybe let's drop this down to 0.1, and then we'll also turn off the ticks. So we'll do axis.ticks equals element blank. And I'm gonna move this down below where I'm doing panel manipulations. So I think that is that nice lighter look, and we've got um, the tick marks removed. I believe their font for their number values is bolded. So I could do that here with axis.text element text face equals bold. And so then those are bolded. Of course, also the Y and X axis titles are also bolded. So I'll go ahead and add that as well. So axis.title equals the same thing. So that's bolded. Good. So their title is also bolded and it's left justified to the plot, whereas mine is justified on the Y axis. So let's go ahead and clean that up a bit. We'll come back here and we'll do plot.title element text uh, face equals bold. And then we'll do plot.title.position equals plot. And so plot justifies it on the left side of the plot or the figure, whereas panel justifies it on the Y axis. Nice, so that's again, left justified. And I think we have all the labels pretty well positioned. Uh, the sizes, I think on theirs, they have a smaller uh, face. I think that the text on ours is actually kind of a grayish color. It seems like it's a different shade than the not farmer here. So I'm gonna go ahead and make all my text black. So I think I can do text equals element, text color equals black. I'm not sure if that did anything. Maybe what I'll do instead because it's the the axis text that's bugging me is here I could do color 
equals black. And so that pops a little bit more like it is black rather than gray. Um, so the next thing I'll do is go ahead and modify our legend. They of course had theirs across the top. So we'll come in here and we'll do legend.position and we'll say top. That now puts the legend at the top. Theirs was left justified. And so now what we can do is legend.justification and we'll say left. And so that's moved it over to the left. This is a lot bigger than the version that was sent to me. So let's see if we can shrink the font size of the title as well as the size of the key. Um, and so let's do legend.title element text and we'll do size equals 10. That got a little bit smaller. Let's go down to like five. So let's maybe make it eight and we'll match theirs with bold. So we'll do face equals bold. I think that's okay. We might make it smaller still, but now we want the key to be smaller. And so I think what we can do is do legend.key.height and we'll do unit and let's do eight because that's the same as the font. Oh, and it needs a unit. So we'll go ahead and do PT. So maybe it could be twice as tall. So maybe here then we'll do 16. So I'm not feeling like we're gaining anything on this. So maybe what we'll do instead is take this down to six and make this 10. And I think that looks pretty good. If we could perhaps deal somewhat with that offset between the title and the, um, the gradient itself. Let's start by dealing with these numbers on the, the legend text. So we'll do, I think it's gonna be legend.text and we can then do element text size equals four. It could probably be a little bit bigger. So let's up it to five. And I think that is good. So the other thing that they had with their label, if you'll recall, was that theirs was at an angle. So let's go ahead and adjust that angle. And I realized we didn't do that for the Y axis either. Uh, so let's do angle equals 45. And so then that gets it angled at 45 degrees. Um, and it's not quite lined up with the tick mark. And I think we can fix that with H just and V just. So we'll do H just equals uh, 0 0.5. That didn't do anything. Let's do H just equals zero. Uh, so that didn't help. <laughs> let's try one. And so H just equals one works. Now let's try V just. Let's try zero there. That moves it down. So let's try one. That moves it up, but didn't really move it anywhere. So I'm gonna remove that V just. And I think there's a margin maybe around the number. So let's do margin equals margin, and then the top, I'm gonna to put zero. And so that puts it right up next to it, but we need some space. So let's give it maybe three. That's a little bit of space. I think that's pretty good. It would be nice to have the percent on that, of course. And so maybe what we could do is we're looking at a gradient. And so this is gonna get us now into fixing the gradient to be more in line with what they had in the original figure. So that color, is very indicative of the Veritas color scale, uh, color theme. So we'll do scale, color, uh, Veritas. And I'm gonna start with B. Um, I'm not sure what it should be, but let's start with there and we'll get the color working. So this gives us a discrete color scale. We're on the right track. Uh, so there's B, C, and D. I thought actually you could do it without the height underscore B. No, okay. So if we try C, C gets us a continuous. What does D do? I'm just curious. We've got what we want, but let's try D. And this is, I think D is for discrete. I don't know what the B stands for. The help wasn't super helpful. Um, if I recall, uh, there's the D, C, B. Um, like I said, I'm not really sure what the underscore B means. Um, the help, help isn't very helpful there. Anyway, um, that's great. Um, and so now what we might want to do are change the values um, that are being represented. And I wonder if we can do the same type of thing that we did here with labels. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this in. And of course we want the C, not the D. And that gets us our percents on our, our tick marks. Very good. So that looks pretty similar to theirs, although I noticed theirs is twisted in the opposite direction. Ah, so <laughs> let's try, um, 180 minus 45 is what? We've got a calculator here. 180 minus 45, 135. So let's try putting in 135. Not quite. <laughs> um, maybe it is 
minus 45. That's more like it. But now I need to fiddle again with my H just. So why don't we try zero? Good. Okay. So that now is angled in the correct direction. I noticed that their legend title is in line with their legend gradient, um, whereas ours is centered with the legend gradient. So I'm going to try to V just that, and maybe we'll do zero, thinking that that might peg it up at the top. That put it at the bottom, but I think we're gaining on it. Let's try one. Very good. So that was uh, V just equals one to be up at the top. I would like to bring the overall legend down, and I think I can do that with um, legend dot box dot spacing. And this is the space between the plotting area and the legend box. And we'll give it the unit function. So let's do zero, just start somewhere crazy. Actually, that's not so bad. <laughs> I think there is a margin around uh, the plotting panel, but I think that looks pretty good. And I'm happy with the way that looks. Um, as we are doing the angling on the, um, the gradient legend, it caused me to think that maybe we need to do something like that on the x-axis. So their x-axis is angled differently from their gradient legend. So we can come back to axis text. So I'm going to make an axis.text.x with element text and then angle equals 45. That got ours angled in the same direction as theirs. Wonderful. So the next thing I want to take on is our diagonal line. I drew it as a solid black thick line. Theirs was a dashed thin line. So let's come back up to geom AB line. We'll do color equals gray, line type equals dashed. Good. We could probably make it thinner like theirs, right? And so we'll come back up to geom AB line and maybe put some of this stuff on a separate line and we'll do line width equals 0 0.25. It's a little bit thicker, I think, than our grid lines. But that looks pretty good. So the next thing that we need to take on are our labels. And um, this is going to be a harder part. So a couple things occur to me. So first of all, their plot didn't include all of the labels, especially if they fell right on the line, then it wasn't that big of a deal, right? They were mainly interested in things that were further away from the diagonal line where the difference was bigger, right? So I think what I'll do is make a pretty label column, right? So I'm make a pretty label and I'll say if else. So if a uh, difference is bigger than let's say three, then we're going to put in the value. Otherwise it's going to be nothing, right? And then pretty label, we're going to map into label, right? So I need to get my seed and run everything again. And so now what we see is that we've winnowed down the labels that we're interested in, but our text still falls right on top of each of those symbols. And so we need to move it aside. Before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and shrink the font of the label a bit. And we'll do that up here in Geom Text. And so we can do size. And it, as I type this in, you'll recall in previous episodes, I struggle with there being a different unit of font size in Geom Text versus in theme. And I see here that there is a size unit. And so I could use the same font sizes and tell it I want it to be in points. So let's do size equals five, and then we'll do size.unit equals PT. And so that gives us five point font. Maybe it could be a little bit bigger. Um, I'm really glad I found that argument. Sometimes those pop-ups are really helpful. <laughs> I think that's a nice size font. It's not so big as it was before, but now we certainly need to move that, that text off of the symbol. So one option, would be to use the nudge X and nudge Y arguments in Geom text and give basically each of these different labels its own nudge. That's gonna get really tedious to try to figure out each of those. Instead, there's a package called ggrepel. So I'm gonna go do library ggrepel and I haven't installed it. Um, so if I save my R script, it'll say package ggrepel is required but not installed. Let's go ahead and install that RStudio, thanks. All right, so I'll go ahead now and rerun everything and that all works. And so the drop-in that we can use instead of geom text would be geom text repel. And I'm getting some error messages right off the bat. It doesn't like my size unit, ah, whatever. So let's go ahead and remove uh, the size and the size unit. And let's see what geom text repel gets us. 
So I'm noticing that I must be excluding something with this walkability um, not getting shown on the plot. So maybe I'll go up to 60 on my limits. So that was in chord equal. So let's do 60 and 60. And so now we see walkability is there. So I was getting uh, two unlabeled data points, but I think I've got all of my text here now. Um, you'll notice like historical value has a bar going out to it. Why don't I go ahead and try to shrink the font size and see if that might make that error message go away. So in here, I'll do size equals, let's try two. And so that makes the font a bit smaller. Um, let's maybe up it to say three. So I'm getting that warning message about overlaps again, but I still have all of my points here. And so I think what I'd like to have, we saw this when I had forgotten walkability that there was a little bar going up to it. And I think we also saw it with some of these others down here. So you can have a bar linking the text with the point. And so if we come back up to geom text repel, we can do min segment length. And if I put zero, it's gonna force it to have a segment there. And so now we can kind of see um, our text with the point. Um, I think that looks pretty nice. I would kind of rather have some of these further away from the text, like this openness. I wouldn't mind it being off to the right or bicycling a little further off. And so an argument that we could try using here in Geom Text Repel would be, would be box padding. Um, and I'm not sure what this is gonna take. Uh, so amount of padding around a box, bounding box is unit, a number defaults to 0.25. Let's try 0.5. So I like this. I like having the text pointing to the points with a decent amount of line. Not sure why this cost of living is still in there. Um, maybe if we increased that from 0.5 to say 0.75, that cost of living likes being in there. I'm not sure why. Let's put it down to maybe, um, let's try 0.5 again. Um, something else we can modify is the space around the point in Geom Text Repel, point padding. So again, amount of padding around labeled point as unit or number defaults to zero. Um, so we'll do point padding and then let's do unit 0.25 uh, PT, didn't really do anything. <laughs> and let's up this, maybe let's do five. And I think what this is doing is this is putting a padding around the point so that um, the line pointing to it doesn't exactly touch it, right? So that's kind of cool. Um, I kind of like that actually. Yeah, I don't mind having that, that that's pretty cool. So I think this looks pretty good. Um, doing that GG Repel stuff wasn't so hard. To be totally honest with you, GG Repel isn't something that I use day in and day out. So I have to remind myself how to use the package and how to use that GG Repel text function. But as you can see, uh, it's pretty straightforward and it's not that hard to do and has some really nice parameter values to improve uh, the, the readability, if you will, of, of the plot. One last thing that's just kind of annoying me is this dashed line seems to be going over the points and the text. And so that geom AB line, maybe it's not over the text, it must just be over the points. So we'll move this ahead of geom point. And so now that is falling behind the points. Wonderful, um, I'm pretty happy with that. And yeah, I think this is a pretty nice plot. It's got some features that I wouldn't do. I'm not a big fan of diagonal. I don't think the diagonal really helps here. I don't think it's even necessary here on the X axis nor is it really on, um, on this, this gradient legend. But hey, you know, you do what you think is good for you. And otherwise, I really like having these individual labeled points. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for sending this in. And um, I hope you've enjoyed my treatment of it. It's a little bit different than the version that was sent to me, mainly because I didn't have the data and I didn't have all the labels. And so I just made up some labels here and made up some data but hopefully you can see that this general approach would generalize to a number of dis different situations. I know we see something a lot like this with like what's called a volcano plot in gene expression data, where there's maybe one gene that's expressed really high and differently from everything else. And people wanna know, what is that point? <laughs> well, you could use um, ggrepel, right? Um, we also talked about that we'd seen something like this when I was going over the COVID vaccine data a while back. In the next episode, I'm gonna take a slightly different strategy from this. And on the x-axis, I'm gonna put farmer and non-farmer. And then for each of these 20 different categories, I'm gonna draw a line between the two of them to indicate if there's 
higher or lower preference of any of these values relative to the others. So that you don't miss that episode, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Of course, please do send me um, your favorite visual that you would like me to give the full treatment on, and I would love to do that for you. So keep practicing with this stuff, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.